It's 10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10, our top story. Sky News reports from the troubled Caribbean nation of Haiti in the grip of violence and disorder. This place is a, in a constant battle with gangs who want to take control of it. If they do, if the vigilantes and the police fail to keep a hold of it, then pretty much the whole of Port-au-Prince will belong to the gangs. Suspects charged with carrying out Moscow's deadliest terror attack for 20 years appear in court as Vladimir Putin continues to blame Ukraine. The threat to British democracy from China, new sanctions for individuals suspected of Beijing-backed cyber attacks. Also tonight, the king's nephew says Charles is frustrated that his recovery is taking longer than he'd like. He's in good spirits. I think uh, ultimately he's hugely frustrated. Um, he's, a, he's frustrated that he can't, can't get on and do everything that he wants to, wants to be able to do. Plus, Ireland is said to have its youngest ever leader, with the unopposed Simon Harris poised to become the new prime minister. And we'll take a first look at tomorrow's front pages in our press preview from 10.30. Good evening. The Caribbean nation of Haiti is in the grip of chaos. Ordinary people are at risk from apparent random acts of violence, with groups of men fighting alongside the police to protect their barricaded neighborhoods. Well, at least 80% of the capital city is in the control of armed gangs, and tonight France is organizing evacuations for its citizens. The airport is closed, and with no operational government, it's difficult to see how the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere moves forward. Our chief correspondent, Stuart Ramsey, is in Port-au-Prince, and a warning, his report contains distressing images from the start that you may find upsetting. Another day in Port-au-Prince, a lull in the fighting and the cars are back on the streets. Another day and another body on the side of the road. It's becoming normal here. This man was shot, his family covered him and left. Burials are expensive. Another street, two more bodies, a man and a woman shot as they rode a motorcycle. Nobody knows why any of these murders are happening. We see the dead every day. This city is burning and there seems to be no end, no solution, perhaps even no hope. Neighbourhood after neighbourhood is barricaded off. Some are gang territories, some are communities trying to protect themselves. Absolutely nowhere feels safe. Through the barricades we were given permission to enter a place called Solino. This community of about 10,000 people has been attacked by two separate gangs for a year. They want to take it over. At least 80% of Port-au-Prince has fallen to the gangs, but not here. That's because Salino is protected by armed vigilantes and off-duty policemen who live here and fight together. Every day, this is a struggle to survive. They are surrounded. The armed defenders of Salino, the men who do the fighting, did not want to be identified. Guided by a policeman, we were taken to the various barricades that protect Salino. On the other side is gang territory. It really is that close. So one gang here, barbecue here, and another one here? Or? Uh, it's That's all barbecue. Barbecue, uh -huh. came here, Bella. Uh -huh. Bella, after Bella, there's Cache de Zifé. Cache de Zifé, Iso, Village de Dieu. All gangs, all, all gangs. gangs. But not here. This is police. The front lines are deserted. Nobody lives here now. It really is a battlefield. Homes burnt out by the gangs have been taken back, but they're uninhabitable. This place is a, in a constant battle with gangs who want to take control of it. If they do, if the vigilantes and the police fail to keep a hold of it, then pretty much the whole of Port-au-Prince will belong to the gangs. The atmosphere is really different to other places. It's quiet, but that's because obviously the vigilantes are here. We've just seen uh, police patrolling, but it is a constant gun battles here, and they're constantly having to keep guard of their property. 
inside the community looks pretty much like anywhere else in Port-au-Prince. But keeping it like this isn't easy. The regular attacks kill men on both sides. It's a turf war and the vigilantes are holding on. They believe they will win, or rather, they hope they will. It's us citizens along with the police officers who are controlling this area. Without them, we wouldn't have what you see here in Salino. And we continue to fight tooth and nail, night and day, to protect the area. When the roads of Port-au-Prince go quiet, you know it's dangerous. This is the main road to the international airport. It's the only place guarded by the military, but it's completely closed. The overwhelming sense you get is of a capital city not only cut off from the rest of the country, but cut off from the rest of the world. It's a siege from within, and everyone is a prisoner. And Stuart joins me now from the Haitian capital, Port-au-Prince. Stuart, you paint a desperate picture. What do you think the chances are of restoring order with the creation of some kind of transitional government there? Yeah, well, if that, that transitional government's meant to have seven members. At the moment, they've only got six, and uh, there's no indication of when the seventh will be chosen or even when uh, they will start uh, sitting. If they do, the former prime minister, who's no longer in the country, will officially uh, step down, and then they will uh, schedule a time for new elections. The problem here, of course, is that the gangs have already said that they're not going to take part, they won't support this at all. They're threatening politicians. And so it's hard to believe, but it things could actually get worse here. There could be another spike in the violence. And the, the hope amongst everyone here is that there will be peace of some description. But at the moment, that doesn't look likely at all. Stuart Ramsey with the latest there from Port-au-Prince in Haiti. Stuart, thank you. Three suspects accused of killing at least 137 people uh, in an attack inside a Moscow concert hall have appeared in court, charged with terror offences. Footage of President Putin tearfully lighting a candle for the victims was released as Russia held a day of national mourning. The Islamic State group has released a graphic video of the attack to back up its claim that it was responsible. But the Russian president continues to point the finger at Ukraine. Here's our international correspondent. John Sparks. They waited in the rain for an opportunity to express their sorrow. Flowers were laid in a giant pile outside the burnt out hall, and private tributes were offered. <laughs> Priests blessed the proceedings with incense and prayers as the people of Moscow spoke of their shock. It's a terrible tragedy, and we're here to honour the memory of all the victims. And I must say that we're together with you, and we support everyone. We're with you. It is the worst act of terror here in 20 years, and the authorities are yet to determine the full extent. Rescue workers search the auditorium, but heavy lifting equipment is required to locate those still unaccounted for. The survivors face a different test, for they must contend with their memories. There was panic. Everyone was running here and there. We realised that there would be no hostage taking. We had to do something, run away, because somebody was coming to kill us all. In newly released footage captured at the beginning of the massacre, we see the gunmen as they approach the reception doors. Ticket holders seem unsure at first, before fear and panic set in. A small group seeks protection behind a pillar, with the gunman just a few metres away. Footage of the assault has also been released by Islamic State, which claims responsibility for this well-organised attack. The gunmen speak in Arabic to camera and to each other. Kill them and have no mercy, directs one. This assertion by IS has largely been ignored in Russia. Although the US thinks it's credible, officials say they warned the Russians, in private and public, of an attack like this. Seeking to demonstrate competency, the judicial agencies have paraded four men accused of carrying out the assault. 
this group thought to originate from Central Asia. However, the Russian president has tried to tie this incident to Ukraine. Well, I think we have very little confidence in anything the Russian government says. Um, we know that they are uh, creating a, a smokescreen of propaganda to defend an utterly evil invasion of Ukraine. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not a tragedy when innocent people lose their lives, when you have horrible bombings. But I take what the Russian government says with an enormous pinch of salt. While slow to speak publicly about the tragedy, the Kremlin has now released these pictures of President Putin praying for the victims. An attempt to demonstrate compassion, it seems, as the nation mourns its collective loss. John Sparks, Sky News. And in response to the attacks in Moscow, France has raised its national security alert. It's been increased to its highest level following a meeting of the Defence and National Security Council. Well, Russia has carried out a massive round of airstrikes targeting the Ukrainian capital city, Kyiv, and the western city of Lviv, targeting critical national infrastructure. Poland has demanded an explanation, meanwhile, from Moscow after one of the missiles briefly entered Polish airspace. The Ukrainian military said it hit two large Russian landing ships and attacks on the annexed Crimean Peninsula, as well as a communications center used by the Russian Navy in the Black Sea. Sky News understands that Britain will tomorrow announce plans to sanction anyone believed to be involved in Chinese-backed cyber attacks on UK politicians and institutions. The government is expected to outline plans tomorrow and reveal details of attacks on the Electoral Commission and 43 individuals, including MPs and peers. Sky News has approached the Chinese embassy for comment. Here's our chi chief political correspondent, John Craig. We recognise China poses a systemic challenge to our values and interests. What they are is an epoch-defining challenge for our country. China in the dock. With a UK general election looming, the government is to accuse Beijing of interfering in British politics and aiming to undermine democracy. The Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, is expected to tell MPs that China is behind a string of cyber attacks on UK politicians. Four vocal China hawks, former Tory leader Sir Ian Duncan Smith, ex-minister Tim Lawton, crossbench peer and former Lib Dem MP Lord Alton and SNP MP Stuart MacDonald have also been summoned to a briefing by Parliament's head of security. Another senior MP who's had cyber attacks says in election year the government needs to legislate urgently to protect democracy. I think it's no surprise that most members of parliament these days are unfortunately receiving a regular number of cyber attacks from all sorts of actors. Last summer I had a rather severe uh, cyber attack but very fortunately Microsoft picked it up. I think we need to look at legislation around deep fakes. There is a reality that we're going to see this get worse and worse as a problem. So this is Pressure on the government to act against the Chinese has come from intelligence chiefs both in the UK and abroad. The Joint Chiefs of MI5 and the FBI came together in an unprecedented joint statement to say that China was our biggest security threat. They've been screaming this from the rooftops, and it's an open secret, I think, that they're very frustrated at the lack of action that's been taken. After Mr Dowden's common statement, the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, is due to address Tory backbenchers at the 1922 committee. <laughs> Some Tory MPs fear Lord Cameron, who famously hosted China's president in a pub in 2015 when he was prime minister, is soft on China. The big problem with cyber attacks on MPs, according to experts, is that they're an easy target. The government needs to make sure that MPs are adequately protected, not just physical protection from various terrorist threats, but cyber protection as well. And they and their staff probably also need better education. Downing Street insists the UK has an eyes-wide-open approach to China. Ministers will hope their warnings will open MPs' eyes to the threat of cyber attacks. And John joins us live now from Westminster. John, what's prompted this move from the government now? 
Well, pressure from all sides, really. First of all, the intelligence services, both here and in the United States, and it's uh, expected that the US will have some announcements to make on China as well tomorrow. Uh, also, uh, pressure from those China hawks, uh, the, uh, led by Sir Ian Duncan Smith, Pressure also from the Intelligence and Security Committee, which produced a devastating report last year accusing the government and, uh, uh, and MPs of complacency on this. And finally, from in, within the government, really, Tom Tugendhat, uh, the security minister, has been exerting pressure. And also, amongst ministers, they are keen to show that, in fact, the government has not gone soft on China since Mr. Lord Cameron was appointed to the... Um, as Foreign Secretary back in November. Now, those measures will include new sanctions against cyber-hacking criminals and also a tightening of uh, a counter-espionage policy. Now, the government, Mr Dowden will also talk about a cyber-attack on the Electoral Commission back in 2021, although it wasn't revealed until a year later in 2022. Now, that uh, was... Uh, that had uh, access, uh, hacked, what was hacked was records of a, a, a estimated 40 million voters. Now, the Electoral Commission has told Sky News uh, that uh, there was no impact on the political process and they've tightened up on their resilience since then. But there will be a real concern amongst MPs when Mr Dowden makes his statement at these disclosures about the extent of this cyber hacking. And uh, no doubt some of those MPs will say that the measures, sanctions for example, are not tough enough and won't, do, won't have much effect. Our chief political correspondent John Craig with the latest from Westminster. John, thank you. And for more on this, uh, you can scan the QR code on your screen right now and listen to the latest episode of our Politics at Jack and Sam's podcast. This week, our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, and Politico's UK editor, Jack Blanchard, look at how the UK is facing up to those cyber threats, both domestically and abroad. French police are being accused of using dangerous tactics to try and stop people on small boats from trying to cross the English Channel. Footage has emerged appearing to show French officers circling a dinghy in an attempt to prevent those on board reaching Britain. Sky's Paul Kelso reports. In waters off Dunkirk last October, a small boat loaded with migrants is heading for Britain. The French Maritime Police appear to want to stop them. A vessel allegedly paid for by the UK sends waves over the side of the migrants' inflatable. As the passengers try and bail out water, the police return for a second pass. Apparently employing pushback tactics, campaigners say could put lives at risk. But a former senior Border Force official says maybe doing the opposite. It would appear that the French are trying to force this boat back because if they didn't, there's probably better than a 50-50 chance that it would sink. So, in fact, um, this, this, while this looks not very good, in fact, it may actually be uh, an effort to save lives. In a second separate video released by Lighthouse Reports, French police brandish pepper spray at a migrant boat and tell them to turn back. The only way to save life is to remove the need for people to make dangerous journeys. And you can't do that if all you are offering is somehow stopping a boat and doing nothing to ensure the person has access to a safe asylum procedure. Even if these tactics are routinely deployed, they appear to be doing little to interrupt the flow across the channel. Home office figures show 29,437 people arrived in small boats in 2023. So far this year, 4,306 have already made the journey, a 17% increase on this time last year. And last Wednesday, 514 people crossed a record for a single day. Last year, the Prime Minister promised to stop the boats. But having failed to deliver, finding deterrence is at the heart of immigration policy. While Parliament continues to tussle over deportations to Rwanda, the government is paying the French to do more to stop boats leaving in the first place. 
The British government has long urged the French authorities to do more to stop small boat departures and last year agreed to pay almost £500 million for more help. The Home Office wouldn't comment specifically on these videos or the use of pushback tactics at sea, but did say it will do whatever is necessary to stop these perilous and fatal journeys. That will include a new social media campaign to try and discourage migrants in danger the moment they step aboard. Paul Kelso, Sky News. The King's nephew, Peter Phillips, has said Charles is frustrated that his recovery is taking longer than he would want it to. Speaking to Sky News Australia, the son of the Princess Royal said the King remains in good spirits as he continues cancer treatment. He's in good spirits. I think, uh, ultimately, he's hugely frustrated. Um, he's, a, he's frustrated that he can't, can't get on and do everything that he wants to, wants to be able to do. Um, but he is, he's, he's very pragmatic. He, he understands that there's a, there's a period of time that he really needs to um, focus on himself. Well, doctors are warning of an alarming rise in the number of young people being diagnosed with cancer. Specialists say that it's not yet clear what is causing the rise in cases, although it's thought that genetics may be a factor. Sky's Rachel Venables reports. It has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be OK. The conversation no parent wants to have at any age. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. But at 42 years old, the Princess of Wales is part of a generation that seems to be getting cancer younger. Stevie is currently going through chemo for breast cancer. There are definitely some experiences that are specific to younger people. Um, and things that people have said to me, for example, are the loneliness that I mentioned, where you, know, you go to the chemo ward and you're the, you're the only young person there. Um, fertility is an issue. And for me personally, the biggest impact has been a financial impact. Um, I'm a small business owner. I worry more about money than I worry about dying. It's as cancer doctors have noticed a rise in much younger patients. Please be reassured, though, it is still relatively rare compared to older people, but we are seeing it increase in frequency. It's all in all quite worrying that we're seeing this rise because people are having to have treatments that end up becoming very nasty, disfiguring. They can involve chemotherapy. And for patients who go through it, it's the last thing they need at a young age. Research last year found global cancer cases in people under 50 had risen by 79% between 1990 and 2019. Researchers estimate that the global number of new early-onset cancer cases will rise by a further 31% in 2030, with those in their 40s the most at risk. Experts think this is down to a number of things, from improved screening to genetics to things like alcohol consumption, smoking and bad diets. But there's good news too. The rate of people aged 35 to 69 dying of cancer is falling. We've seen um, cancer mortality in that age group uh, reduced by about a third um, over the last 25 years, really reflective of uh, progress that we've made. But there is still a long way to go. Spin. This rise in younger people developing cancer is traumatising for them, but also heaping yet more pressure on a health service that's already buckling. Rachel Venables, Sky News. And just to tell you that on Sky News Breakfast tomorrow, Kay Burley has sat down with the United States Ambassador to the UK. During that chat, which took place shortly before the Princess of Wales' cancer diagnosis, the Ambassador also had these kind words for Catherine. Talk to me about the royal family. Uh -huh. um, news of Kate's edited photo made the White House news conference, which was... I didn't know oh, that. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it did, actually. <laughs> Well, listen, I just, I want her to know that we are thinking about her, um, that we care deeply about her. We want her to feel better as soon as she can. And I think just being an American, uh, Americans love the royal family. 
that interview on Sky News Breakfast tomorrow. Now, Simon Harris has been confirmed as the new leader of Fine Gael, paving the way for him to become Ireland's youngest premier. The announcement was made this afternoon after it was clear that no one else would challenge Mr Harris for the role. Our senior Ireland correspondent, David Blevins, has more. They were already lauding their new leader, but had to wait for the official result. 37-year-old Simon Harris turning a page in Ireland's history, the youngest ever Taoiseach Prime Minister-elect. I hereby declare Minister Simon Harris TD elected as the new leader of Fine Gael. It's the absolute honour of my life to formally be here with you today in Athlone to accept the leadership of this great party. He spoke of the need for hope and security and won rapturous applause for condemning the use of the Irish flag on the coffin of an IRA man last week. We stand for streets that are safe and crime that is never allowed to go unchecked. And in a week where I saw the tricolour of this republic draped over the coffin of a Garda killer, I say, shame, let's take our flag back. Change in leader, Leo Varadkar bowing out, no change in foreign policy, Ireland's outrage over the war in Gaza. And Simon Harris wants a good relationship with the UK. I'd welcome, should I be given the honour of serving in the office of Taoiseach, um, an opportunity to engage uh, early uh, with the British Prime Minister. This country remains strongly pro-European. Our home in the European Union is crucial to who we are, to our identity and to our economic success. But good, strong economic, social, personal, interpersonal relations with our nearest neighbour in the United Kingdom is always going to be a major, major part um, of Ireland's um, diplomatic policy. Fine Gael has made its decision. Opposition parties say the next Taoiseach should be chosen by the people, not by one party. But Simon Harris doesn't sound like a man who's planning on calling a general election anytime soon. He's Taoiseach in waiting until Parliament returns from Easter recess, but with 12 months maximum to prove himself to the electorate, he hasn't a moment to waste. David Blevins, Sky News, in Athlone. Okay, let's get the latest sport now from Sky Sports News and Jenna. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people, more active. Live life with Vitality. One in five people are neurodivergent, meaning they have a difference in brain function. This one in five may be autistic, dyslexic, dyspraxic, or have ADHD, or another form of neurodiversity. I think being in sport as someone who's dyslexic and dyscalculic um, can be really challenging day to day, particularly with the numbers and distances and times and things. I think it's something that I've come to realise that the reasons why I do sport have very much to do with the fact that I am neurodiverse as well. Obviously, people will have heard probably of, of dyslexia. I mean, give me a sense of um, what it's like to, to, be, to be both dyslexic and dyscalculic. Dyslexia is words um, and literacy. I'll read a passage of text and I could read it three or four times, but it might not fully go in. So processing in my brain takes a little bit longer. Um, but for me, with dyscalculia, I feel like that affects me a lot more as an adult. Give me a sense of, of how that all comes, comes to play. What, what are the main challenges, would you say, in sport? I've been known to miss a couple of flights. Um, and yeah, I think when you see those things on the board where I've sort of read the flight time, and that sort of moved and the gate number haven't aligned. Just little things like that. Little things like even telling the time on a non-digital clock or knowing how far a distance is in training um, affect me in my day-to-day -day still as an adult. Particularly on race day, we're usually given a call time for when we need to be ready and in the call room. And you sort of have to work back from that time. So there's a lot of numbers and I usually write out a schedule for every uh, race day for what time I'm going to do everything. Just to take that process of thinking away from a really solid support system really helps. Um, my coach is definitely really on board with that. He'll be like, no, we're just going to do two laps a day or three laps or four laps. Um, and that really helps me cognitively to be able to just work out how far I've got to run. Give me a sense of, of how you feel being neurodivergent helps you within, within a sport setting. 
I think if you already have um, really good resilience, then you can bring that to sport. But I think there's little things like attention to detail and spatial awareness that are built into um, different new diversities. I know so many people that think they might be neurodivergent but have never had a diagnosis. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. And that was Sky News at 10. Coming up, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's papers in the press preview. Tonight, we're joined by the barrister and former government minister, Anna Subri, and the columnist, Angela Epstein. Welcome both. Among the stories we'll be discussing, this on the front of the Financial Times, their headline, US and Japan plan security pact upgrade to resist China. We'll be right back. It's a really exciting day for us because we've got uh, a new young pair of snow leopards into the zoo. We really haven't had uh, such a threatened and such an iconic species like this for many, many years here at the zoo. So the two have joined us, young male, young female, both just under two years old uh, and really are going to be the foundation of our breeding program moving forward here. So it's really exciting for us. Uh, settling in slowly, we've had to be very careful and quiet about settling uh, settling them down uh, once they settle down they themselves are not too difficult a species uh, to look after their needs are fairly simple they're very hardy i mean where they come from in central asia they're used to the most extreme and inclement of weather uh, so settling them down feeding them and so on and the, the daily care is not too complicated compared to some animals we work with here uh, but actually that the habitat we've built for them will help that tremendously because it's it's a superb habitat that we've created for them here at Chester Zoo. The colour is is just exquisite. So they're they have this most amazing camouflage. I think you might be able to see see one of them just just settled and asleep behind me. But they have this most exquisite colour that's designed to make them just blend and disappear in sort of Himalayan mountain, a patchwork of snow and rocks. Uh, but they're much smaller, much lighter, uh, and they even feed right down to feeding on very small voles and squirrels at times. So uh, they live in a much harsher environment as a result of much smaller, much lighter and extremely agile, I should say. For them, jumping sort of 12, 14 feet is nothing. At the moment, uh, because they're so threatened, it's just really important that, that we settle them down. They're still a bit young. Uh, and so they normally wouldn't mature until they're between sort of two and three years old. So we're probably going to have a good year or so while they mature get used to each other they're still separated at the moment we've still got that introduction to go and then who knows perhaps looking at 2025 uh, maybe 2026 for the first breeding and then that really will be a landmark
Hello there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. Over the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the barrister and former government minister Anna Subri and the columnist Angela Epstein. So let's see what is on some of those front pages. Well, the Financial Times reports that the US and Japan are planning a refit of their security pact, the biggest in 60 years, in a bid to counter China. According to The Sun, Chinese hackers access the personal information of around 40 million Britons in a 2021 attack. The Daily Telegraph reports that Whitehall sources believe China, Russia and Iran are fueling disinformation about the Princess of Wales to try to destabilize the nation. The Guardian leads with the two suspects of Friday's terrorist attack in Moscow that left 137 people dead, charged and appearing in court. The Eye reports that an extra £760 million will be spent on nuclear with spending allocated to modernize Trident. On the front of the Express, the King will release a powerful Easter message this week to provide reassurance to the nation. The Times' lead story focuses on higher education, and it says that Britain's leading universities now get most of their fees from overseas students. The Metro reports that people donated a record nearly 14 billion to charity last year. And the Daily Star says it's joining the, sh the search for a shipwreck believed to contain four billion pounds worth of gold. See if they find it. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the program, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch us. As I mentioned, we're joined tonight by Anna Subri and Angela Epstein. Thank you both so much for being with us. Okay, let's take a look at the front page of The Telegraph. A sort of interesting take on a story that we've been talking about um, for weeks. So China and Russia behind slurs on the princess. And of course, this uh, links to the wild speculation that there has been for weeks over the health of, uh, of Catherine. Um, Anna, what do you make of it? Well, in a way, this strikes me as a statement of the bleeding obvious. L let me explain that, in the sense that... So, if you read that what The Telegraph have written, they quote a government spokesman or woman saying, part of the modus operandi of hostile states is to destabilise things, whether that is undermining the legitimacy of our elections or other institutions. Well, twas ever thus. I mean, that is what hostile states do, is they undermine a country's stability as well as doing other things. And, of course, one of the perfect ways to do that is to put up fake bots and all the other peculiarities that exist on social media and basically put out stuff that's untrue, uh, offensive, conspiracy theories and so on and so forth. And it's as if our media has been slow coming to this. Or maybe it's because with the demise of the old Soviet Union, with our attempts to do trade with China, we thought that these hostile states were actually becoming nice and good people, mm. whereas, in fact, they're not, and they're just doing their old tricks. But now they can do it on a scale we've never seen before because of social media. And too many of our own citizens, frankly, are too willing to believe a load of yeah. this nonsense. But it should not be underestimated. As they say, whether it's elections, and I dare I say it, I include the EU referendum in that, I think it'll one day all come out. Uh, and some of the slurs on the, on, uh, the Princess of Wales have been, it, it would seem, from those sorts of sources. I mean, what I find remarkable about this story in particular is we, we were talking, Anna and I, beforehand, because so much coverage is related to the Princess of Wales and obviously her, her devastating diagnosis um, that, that was released on Friday and the very brave way that she held herself to account and was almost bullied into having to speak yeah. about what happened precisely because yeah. of this whole culture of disinformation. And I find it remarkable that spreading disinformation about the Princess of Wales, amongst many other things, should be regarded as a source of destabilising. How is it? How can she... How can inaccuracies about a princess... She's not an elected uh, yeah. individual. She has no role in governance. And yet... It's, it's not it, an election that you're trying it, to It's swear. exactly... No, it's, it's, not, it's not about accessing records. The, the records that, that, that um, were, were accessed, that the 40 million or so voters who may have been compromised in the 2021 cyber attack, yes, that's very significant in terms of how we define government. But the Princess of Wales saying one thing or because another it about her... It destabilises... Because That's the monarchy, the, is a, thing. the monarchy is an institution which 
I mean, I'm very proud of it. You know, I, I, I like, we, we like the royal family. We are a, a parliamentary democracy, but we have part of that, part of what makes us the country and the governance of our country is having our royal family, the yes. role of the king and so on and so forth. And so you start to put doubt in and, and to destabilise, that, that's exactly what they will always do, whichever the institution is, whether it's the courts yeah. um, or whether it's our royal family. But it's just this idea of this kind of nefarious underbelly that, that, that is sort of looking even to the sort of the very personal details of... I agree. She's such a benign figure, yeah. the Princess of Wales. Whether you're a monarchist or not, whether, you're, whether you like the pomp and circumstance of the whole monarchy, she's, she's just very pleasant and she has some very, very good ideas about mental health and, and you know, the welfare of children. So for her to be some kind of target, it's such anathema to that whole underworld, don't you think so? Let's take a look at a, another story that's kind of linked to it. Front page of The Sun, if we yep. can pull it up. China hack attack on the UK. Chinese hackers access the personal details of 40 million UK voters in an assault on our democracy. Um, Angela, tell us a little bit about yeah. what's behind this. So, th so this is just sort of coming to light now, this, this complex cyber attack on the, on the Electoral Commission. It was understood to start around 2021, but it didn't actually come to light till October 22. And um, it, I think it was only acknowledged last year that there was even an issue. Um, and as part of this attack, what, what happened was that the, 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 the attackers were able to access copies of the Electoral Register, including the names and addresses of, of countless voters who had registered to vote between 2014 and 22. And then they had access to this huge body of information. And wrapped up with that, there's some suggestion that 43 individuals, including MPs and peers, uh, were also targeted. So that's an enormous kind of dollop of information um, that, that has been sort of accessible because of cyber attack. And, and one wag sort of pointed out that, well, at least paper makes it hard to infiltrate votes because at least when you go in a ballot box yeah. and you do your X, so, you know, nobody can get in there. But it is but deeply stories, concerning. Yeah, I mean, it does make us feel quite vulnerable, I guess. Well, we are. And, I mean, there are certain members of parliament being very brave and courageous in standing up and saying China is a threat. And I think, for, as I, I come back to this, for a lot of us, you would sort of, for a lot of people would think, well, oh, come on, those days have long gone. Mm. They haven't. And that, it, it, it is a reality and it will continue to be a threat whilst you have these terribly undemocratic authoritarian countries like China. But the, with these, the, the, they... They, they are incredibly powerful economically, and that's why so many people have been concerned about the technology we buy from China yeah. and so on and so forth. But we forth. want it both ways. On but the other we hand, want we want to very highly high by it. Are, are, we, are we unprepared for this kind of thing? Oh, yes, Manifestly no so. When, when I was yes. a member of parliament, we were... Uh, my email uh, was hacked. I mean, along with many oh, others. Wow. Yeah, but many others. I mean, we were all vulnerable to it. But then we are all vulnerable yeah, to it. Yeah, every but day But it's just when week, it becomes yeah. MPs and when it becomes... You you know, that this sort of information and obviously financial institutions, we rightly get particularly concerned. Let's take a look at another story, which of course has been dominating the headlines over the past few days. Front page of The Guardian, and that uh, is linked to that horrific attack in Moscow. Suspects appear in court accused of Moscow attack that left 137 dead. Anna. Yes, they've got the people responsible for this appalling atrocity. Um, and uh, am, I, am I wrong in thinking, but isn't it unusual? when these sorts of terrible incidents happen, these terrorist attacks, actually to capture everybody responsible? Because normally... Maybe they're not either... in Russia. Sorry? Maybe not in Russia. But, but maybe not in Russia, because... Well, it's uh, a surveillance state, yeah. I mean, you know... No, no, but also, is... we. I mean, we're going on, on their word that, you know... We, yes, we really know. exactly, because normally they either kill themselves mm. or they're killed by the forces who are trying to save the people yeah. and so on and so forth. I, there's something about this that makes me feel very uncomfortable in all the horror of it as to the veracity of all of this. I, I'm afraid I don't trust Putin further than yeah. I could throw him. And I think the attempts to smear Ukraine is a very good example. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're it, in court. It, it, it well, while you mentioned, stinks. forgive me, Angela, let's just pull up the front page of the Financial sure. Times and yes. then I'll ask you, because you mentioned Ukraine. Uh, so front page of the Financial Times, Moscow concert attack, Putin directs Russian anger
finger at Ukraine as suspects interrogated. interrogated. So, Angela, even though Islam, uh, ISIS-K yes. have claimed responsibility, the US says it's them, ISIS-K have even released a video, um, Putin is still pointing the finger to Ukraine. Well, the, the, this plays to his agenda on many levels. On the one hand, he can use this, he's trying to implicate Ukraine, so he can use this as an excuse to um, massively mobilise and, and accelerate the um, the the attack on Ukraine. He has some sort of credible reason to do so. Also, I mean, you know, Putin, I don't know him personally, <laughs> newsflash, but he's a man obviously with a monumental ego, as, as most despots are. And this has been an attack on his vulnerability. You're busy invading another sovereign nation. Meanwhile, on your doorstep, the biggest terror attack in years has happened. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, he's trying to weaponize it in order to, to bolster his reason for attacking Ukraine. And on the other hand, he's, he's, it's called into question just how much he can protect his own citizens. So, you know, on, on every level, it, it looks poor. I mean, the ISIS-K are, are the branch of IS that have relentlessly gone after European targets in Russia and, and other places. So the kind of the maths adds up. But any which way, this is, for a man of his kind of um, complexion, this is going to very much kind of be a destabilising yeah, thing and, for and him. And we've seen France just in the past two hours, mm. I think, raise its terror threat level uh, to the highest level uh, possible. I mean, and it does look like he is going to use this as an excuse. But you see, it's the word interrogated in that headline. He's, they, and, and we've seen, we've referred to the fact that two of them um, are on the front page of another paper because they're appearing in court. It's the interrogation. What, what, what are the chances of the so-called interrogation, which will be torture, that yeah. there won't be then that a claim from Putin that they've made some sort of admission sure. that Ukraine was bizarrely in some way involved? You I mean, can't imagine due process goes on in a way no. as it does in other countries. It, it, more, more examples of what an a, a, what a absolute war criminal uh, and what a horror Putin is. And the Ruthless, dangerous, murderous... Mm. Just Don't beyond the pale. <laughs> well, well, he is, isn't he? And Angela, thank you so much. We'll be back uh, in a second looking at more of the day's uh, stories, or rather tomorrow's stories. But coming up, the NHS should exploit private health care to get back on track, argues the Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting. I'm Adam Parsons. I'm Sky's Europe correspondent based here in Brussels. More flares going off, a, a volley of rocks, cobbles have been pulled up uh, out and are being used as missiles to hurl at these police. We take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. We have now left Italy and entered France. Nobody's asked to check our identity. Made by people who dare to challenge. Nice to see you again, Mr. Barnier. Why? Why? Nice meeting you. Fishing does have the potential to stymie an enormous economic deal. What strikes you when you come to this glacier is not just the way in which the environment is changing, but the speed at which those changes are happening. It's uh, devastating, actually. There's always more to the news than a headline. We want to discover, to delve a little deeper, to find out what's really going on. Explanation, analysis, the people, at the heart of every story. I'm Neil Patterson, and this 
is the Sky News Daily Podcast. Alex Crawford joining us now from Ukraine. Their personal possessions are all scattered around the place. Our economics and data editor, Ed Conway, try and make sense of uh, the big numbers for us. Things can change incredibly quickly, and that's what they have done. So, by the end, we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. You're watching the press preview with me now, barrister and former government minister Anna Subri and the columnist Angela Epstein. Thanks so much for staying with us. Okay, let's take a look at the front page of the Financial Times. And the story, NHS should exploit private health care to get back on track, argues Wes Streeting. Anna. I'm a big. Oh, I'm, about I'm a big fan of West Streeting. Um, we both worked together in Parliament when I was an MP. Uh, so uh, all around, I think he's uh, somebody certainly to watch for the future. And mm -hmm. if Labour win the next election, he's going to be our health secretary. And in this uh, piece on the front page, the FT, he's talking about that we need to exploit, as it's put, uh, the private healthcare to get back on track. In other words, we've got to use the private sector. And it's, it, there's nothing really that revolutionary about this or new, because mm. what, that's what's happened for some time under both Conservative and Labour governments, when you need to get people into certain types of... Often it'll be things like cataracts, or it'll be uh, hip replacements or knee jobs, and that, then you will use the extra capacity that's in the private sector, um, and I, I don't have, personally have a problem with that. It makes a lot Not of sense. Not at all. I mean, we've got a, a, a backlog of clinical, diagnostic and procedural issues here, waiting this, every single element of, of, of the health service. Um, and if there is capacity, then it, it's just very short-sighted not to use it. Of course, it, it's fraught with kind of social and ethical reasons, but it, it's not without Such precedent. As? Well, just p there are people who are, are fundamentally disposed, not disposed towards private medicine. They, f they see it as a them and us system. Those that can afford it can leapfrog over others. But, but it comes back, I hate this whole politics of envy because there are ordinary people who work very hard who will say, you know what, I don't want to wait six months for my varicose veins um, operation. I'm going to dip into my pot that I was going to use for my dream holiday. I'm going to pay for it. That's a free market economy. And I know that there's an unfair element to that. But, but I think some people will find it difficult to grasp. But ultimately, we've got these huge waiting lists. So what else do you do? There's, there's a bit of... A, which is not to do with this, but there's a bit of an outrageous situation that's occurring where people are being told they have to wait 18 months, two years for, say, a knee joint replacement. Yes. And they are living in terrible pain. And then they are scrimping and scraping to to go into the health, into private health, and that yes. is outrageous in my view. But that's not what this is about. This is about where you've got extra capacity, then let's use that to, to get through the cut through the waiting list. Let's look at another story of you know something that might happen if Labour get in. Again, front page of the Daily Telegraph. Majority of private schools will raise fees if Labour bring in a VAT uh, rate, Anna. Well, I mean, this is, again, a statement, really, of the being obvious, isn't it? Because there's <laughs> loads this evening. There, there's yeah. quite a lot really of that. Obvious. It's weird, isn't it? <laughs> there's sort of not much news around, but there is actually lots of news, but it's not kind of making the front pages. But anyway, yes, I mean, if, if Labour... I mean, I struggle with this one. I mean, I, I'm upfront about this. Both my children were educated privately. I, I wasn't after the age of 11. Um, and... Labour wants to bring in, uh, to charge VAT, and that will have a big impact. And it's not really at the top end that concerns me. It's those people who do make huge efforts Absolutely. to send their children to day school, private day schools. The fees are 
expensive. They're not ludicrously expensive. Yeah. And, and a lot of those people who do scrimp and scrape to do that will find that to be a difficulty. And you've got to remember, if, if loads of people stop using, using the private yeah. sector, then we're going to have to have state... Uh, the, our state system has got to be up to scratch and it's got to take the extra and the capacity. capacity. And the yeah. capacity. <laughs> and again, it comes back to my original point about the politics of envy. You know, I, I went to a private school, but I got a scholarship. You know, my parents wouldn't have afforded to send me. Um, and there are a lot of parents who make decisions about the money they have and education is a priority. Sure, I mean, politics of envy or, you know, unfair advice advantages that people get and children get when they get a better education. But, but, that, but, but it the... shouldn't be like that. The, the better education should be available in the state sector. And, and instead, of we all, all of us put all this anguish into the private sector. Only 7% of children go into private No, but I, I know, and that, Let's that's Let's talk true. about the state sector, making those schools ones that you want to send your but child to. But they're not to. mutually exclusive. The fact mm. is, that in a free market economy, there are things that you can spend your money on if you want to that are, are a higher premium to other if products. It, well, it's like anything. It's like buying a jacket. You can either buy it from a local chain store or you can go design it. If you earn your money and you have it in your pocket, why shouldn't you spend it on the things that you want? That's a separate argument from raising the standards of our state schools, which, which goes without question. We don't have a lot of time, but I really want to look at this story from page of the Metro. £14 billion pounds, uh, given in, in charity to good causes despite cost of living crisis. Did this surprise you? Surprised me. I, I love this. I love this story because it restores faith in human nature. We are absolutely over the head. We are, you know, there's a, a we are completely clubbed the whole time about cost of living crisis, spiralling costs, mortgages in free fall, nobody's got enough money. And still, somehow, the kindness and generosity of human spirit means that people give money to charity. We're going to have to leave it there. And I'll probably ask you this in the next hour. Anna Angela, thank you so much. Warm memories wherever you go. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, the next few days will be unsettled, with temperatures typically around the seasonal average. Northern and eastern Britain will have a mostly fine start tomorrow, with a patchy frost out of town, while Ireland and many western parts will be milder, wet and windy. East Anglia, southeast England and northern Scotland look like staying mostly fine through the morning, although, although increasingly cloudy, but there will be outbreaks of rain elsewhere. There will also be uh, heavy rain over parts of southwestern Britain at times, but will become light and patchy over Ireland, some snow over the Scottish hills. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. And coming up next on Sky News at 11, we'll report from the Caribbean nation of Haiti as the island falls under the grip of gang violence.